Anything you guys want to talk about today before I talk about things that are interesting for me and boring for you? Kendra, you haven't been here for a while, so if there are things that you want to talk about, you can, even though. Intentions. Okay, that's one topic. Anyone else? Matthew? Jamie? JJ? Luke? Bridget? Um, I Yes. Okay. Iron, silver, bronze, and gold. Okay. Okay, Sarah, how about you? Anything? Toby? Um, I, I like the allegory of the cake. Or the I like John Luther. The what? No, last week, the allegory of the cake. Yes. It's about to read. I don't know much about it, but uh, if you give me till Tuesday, I'll read up a little. And then we can talk about it. Will that be okay? I'm pretty sure you've already told one of the stories in class. <laughs> like in there. <laughs> I'm pretty sure when I was reading, I was like, sounds very familiar. <laughs> yeah. Is it anything? Okay. Ricardo? You're too tired. Uh, Logan? Since you feel useless, you assume that your questions are going to be useless as well, so why ask? Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Rebecca? So we have the stages, we have intentions, and we have allegory of the cave. They're really all the same. Let's talk about all of them within the context of the stages, intentions, allegory, the cave, and the rest of it. Do you guys mind? We have a saying in Persian it is much better that you get sick by the hands of a friend than an enemy. If you consider me your friend, then should you get sick, you'll be fine. Because your friends now, what belongs to me belongs to you, and what belongs to you belongs to me. Sounds okay? If you, any of you have any objections about me removing this, let me know. I'll put it back on there. Probably suffocate and die, but it'll be okay. Yeah? Oh, you know, um, just about the math. Uh, they said on March 15th uh, we're not going to need masks in class. I'm still going to wear masks. Yeah, so am I. Yeah, but um, I always do. <laughs> 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 uh, you guys should always wear your masks. It's. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. There comes a point in your life where you desire to live. Not because you know exactly what you're living for, you just want to live. That's what all living organisms want to do, they desire to live. There comes a point in your life where upon reflection you realize that everything you've done while alive, kind of like Logan, is meaningless and useless. 
this tragedy is that he's come to this conclusion at such a young age, he's like 12. Uh, it's much better to reach this conclusion when you're like 50 or 60 or 70. Because then at least you can end your life in a meaningful way. You've come to realize all in a waste. And yeah, it's kind of like Robin Williams. You've been on the stage for most of your life. It's been a good life. You've had attention, you've had power. You've also suffered from boredom, your own unique struggles. You became a drunk, you tried to overcome it. You realize slowly your brain is turning into mush. And so you kind of just end it. Okay. Well, that was my inspiring introduction to the class. Anyone else before we, uh, nothing? Okay. Before we start today's class, let me just remind you that even though I know most of you don't take these ideas seriously as you shouldn't really, they're not good for you. But just in case, once in a while you feel inspired or moved to perhaps walk to the library or a bookstore, perhaps Amazon and buy some books in philosophy, maybe God forbid even major in philosophy, uh, it would be nice if you would not do that. You know, remember that you signed up for this class for three units to get you closer to your goal, which is, I don't know, to fulfill certain requirements and move on to Berkeley or Yale or Harvard and get your degree in business. Make money and live a happy life. Remember, reflection is not natural for us. We don't really know what to do with the outcome of any reflection. So always remember that. So don't go home looking at your companion and asking, do you love me? And if so, I want to know why. Don't go home asking your parents, why did he give birth to me? You know, don't ever ask yourself why you're in school. Just don't ask any questions. Remain as you are. It's healthy, it's good. Okay. This is just for me to kind of remind myself of what we talked about. Iron. It's a stage that almost all of us are born into. They're physical, they're sensory, they're temporal. And whatever desires you have in the iron stage, they need to be satisfied quickly. You lack the patience, you lack reflective abilities as to why you want to pursue certain pleasures. You don't really question your intentions. That's not the objective of the iron stage. I was watching a video of Snoop Dogg. He's been high for most of his life and he's rather proud of you know, being high, especially on TV, where kids, young adults are watching, and God forbid some of the people who watch him and listen to him, consider him as an icon or an idol or a hero. This is a man perhaps who doesn't reflect on how his action could impact a young mind, how he single-handedly could change the direction of someone's life by encouraging him to get high, to get drunk perhaps, to have unsavory sexual activities. So at the iron stage, remember, you want your pleasures to be simple. Of course, for you, it seems to be somewhat complicated. You want them to be satisfied very, very, very quickly. There is no reflection. What you do, though, is to think. And remember, thinking as reflecting and reflecting are two very, very, very different beasts. The way we usually think in life are a reaction to the forces or events that are imposed upon us, a father getting sick. You're forced to think, okay? Should you send him to the hospital? Should you take care of him? Should you take him to the nursing home? Should you pull the machine, okay? 
Sometimes if you're lucky or perhaps unlucky, thinking can morph into reflection. But remember, thinking is always a reaction to something that's taking place on the outside. It's about you being able to survive, okay? So at the iron stage, you use thinking as a political tool, how to get what you want, okay? This is usually symbolized as the genitalia, okay? It's intense, it's physical, and it's concrete. This is the easiest world to live because down here you can have about a hundred friends. It's not very difficult to find people who get high in Oakland. Okay, if you've come from Oregon and this is your first day in Oakland, your friends are everywhere because everyone gets high. Okay. Validation, conformity happens down here very, very, very quickly. I'm not quite sure how someone graduates from this stage and moves up to the bronze. Okay. The bronze, if this is about physical pleasure, okay, you take yourself much more seriously in the bronze, you care about your future. At a certain point, you look at all the friends you have down here and you categorize them as losers. They're useless, really. What you really want to do at this stage is perhaps just focus on school, get a good job, make some money. Now, the problem with moving up is that you can't basically, simply, just leave the iron and move to bronze. Why? Because if you've lived in the iron world for about like 10 years, and in most of our cases, maybe 20 years, what usually happens, you have cultivated a great amount of habits, ways of thinking, ways of being, ways of feeling, okay? They are addictives, okay? These are things that stay with you and guide the way you think and feel and act. Now you want to take, say, you're in the bronze and you want to take school seriously. Now remember, when you get to bronze, you don't want to go to school to graduate, to make money so you can go back to iron and get high, buy good weed, okay? Have better sex, drink better beer. That's not the objective. You no longer see yourself as basically an unrefined, raw, physical entity. You realize there is something more to you. You eventually take yourself so you say, I do want to buy a house, I do want to get married, I do want to have children. I want to kind of feel somewhat more mature than the way I was during the iron. The moment you move up, all the friends down here will no doubt make you feel incompetent. They become envious of you, jealous of you. They will try to drag you down. Okay, so if most of your friends play video games and get high or get drunk or party a lot, the moment you say, I can't do it tonight because I need to study for my math test, they'll try to make you feel bad. They will try to sabotage your newfound goals in life. Okay, so you need to summon up this will this courage to somehow break from the past and that is going to be profoundly difficult okay so if you're able to move into the bronze in a healthy way okay without the desire of coming back down to the iron and one of the ways you do it is somehow you begin to reflect about your intentions behind drinking perhaps intentions behind having sex perhaps intentions perhaps about partying and getting high, then the more you understand, the easier it is for you to break free from the iron. The less you understand, it means that you are at bronze, but it'll be much easier for you to move back down to the iron and do some of the things that used to, at least long time ago, be pleasurable to you, but now you still have pleasure, but it comes with a good amount of guilt. 
okay? When you move to bronze out of the hundred friends, maybe you'll discover that there are five or ten just like you, but they live in the closet. They always wanted to be serious, go to school, but they had no companions. They had no support system. Now that they find in you a hero, they realize you can be their support system, okay? So out of the hundred friends that you got, or maybe you'll just get rid of all of them because they're no good in your world now. But maybe you'll save 10. So the moment you take school seriously, you realize out of the hundred people that you categorized or defined as your true friends, only 10 remain. They will say nasty things about you on their Facebook page, okay? They will say awful things on their Twitter page. I don't know if it's a page or not, but whatever it is, okay? So remember, whenever you move up, you have a good number of the people that you used to know that now categorize you as dark and gloomy. It's an interesting phenomenon because when Siddhartha, Buddha, wanted to understand what the meaning of life was. He kind of sits with 10, 15 people, they're monks in India, and they're all sitting and fasting and meditating. All of a sudden, the Buddha comes to realize, well, this is no way to understand anything. I don't want to fast. I don't want to pray. I don't want to have ridiculous experiences. I want to understand. So you know what he did? He kind of just opened his eyes and walked to the river and went for a swim. His fellow monks became really, really angry with him. And they tried to make him feel bad for his newfound realization. But because the Buddha understood, he didn't care. And eventually the five, okay, who made him feel bad became his closest disciples. The point I'm trying to make, whenever you find an ounce of maturity about you, you'll have great many numbers of people trying to drag you back to the old world. Okay? So make sure you have a good support system when you go to the bronze. Okay? <clears throat> bronze is still pretty physical in the sense that now you want some stability in life. Remember, from the moment that you and I landed on this place called Earth, we lived in the caves. We had to hunt for animals, okay? Life was profoundly insecure, unstable, uncertain. Everything that we have done for the past couple million years is for the sake of security, stability. We want to know how the future unfolds, okay? You have some of these nutty, crazy thinkers such as Martin Luther on the 15th century who says, live with the reality of death at all times. Or you have someone like Jesus saying, always remain awake because you may die at any time. Well, you don't want to live like that. It's unnatural. It's uncommon. Because if you want to live with the idea of death at all times, it means your goals are irrelevant. They have no value. The prospect of death makes everything about your life meaningless. Unless you know how to live while alive, at the same time, the presence of death. And it's a very, very difficult place to be, to live in both worlds simultaneously. Okay? Now, so bronze is about going to school. I don't know if any of you know Kendra. I doubt that you do. Ever since I've known her, which is about 10, 15, 20 years now, every time I ask her, so how's, how's Majid, her companion? He's Berkeley. He's really studying hard. This is a guy who's devoted to school. Remember what we said on Tuesday. Whatever pleasures you have down here, they'll be satisfied in about a day. That's what Ayan does. If you're at Bronze, Majid, her companion, has been at Berkeley for about five years. Okay? When your goal is five years away from you, you need to exercise a lot of patience. 
You need to resist a lot of temptations. And by the time you get there in a healthy way, you're able to do those things. Now, there comes a point where you're done with school. Remember, that desire has been satisfied. And you and I cannot live, cannot function without desires. I'm not the Buddha. I'm not a Kartola who can live in the moment. I'm a regular chap trying to survive the best I can. All right? Now, what's going to happen in a few months, few weeks, or few years, this man who has just graduated from Berkeley and has a job that pays him about 165000 a year, okay, he's going to look at a companion of his, about five or six years they've been together, and says, will you marry me? Now, you have entered the stage of silver. Okay? Remember, you replaced smoking and drinking and partying with going to school. That's a different kind of dedication and focus and seriousness. Now that you have been satisfied, in other words, you have graduated and now you have found a job and now you have st stability financially, now you say, it's time for me to settle down. You begin to look for a companion. Okay. Now, as you know, relationships are expensive. Buying a house requires financial stability. Buying a ring is expensive. Okay? You look at your companion and say, will you marry me? And depending on how you have been in the past, the answer is either a yes or a no, but let's just say yes. Keep in mind, as you move up these stages, your intentions change. Your worldview change. Everything about you begin to change. So your intention down here is much different than here. Here, you make money to buy weed. Here, you make money to pay rent. Here, you make money to support your wife or husband or children or parents. So the silver stage is about relationships. Committed ones. Okay? Now, this is a very tricky place to be because you have about 10 friends. You want to make sure whoever comes up to the silver with you is not a toxin to your relationship. You certainly don't want someone who keeps tempting you about smoking and drinking and partying. You have a wife or a husband now. You have children now. You certainly don't want anyone to be in your world who's going to waste your time because that time, when you get married and have children, you realize you're very poor now, poor in time, poor in energy. And whoever is in your world, you want to make sure they don't waste what little energy and time you have. So out of the 10, you only have perhaps two. So remember, as you move up, your world begins to shrink. All right? This is called the allegory of the cave. And the assumption that smoking, drinking, sex, and partying will make you happy. At last, you'll come to a place where you realize not only are you not happy, you're in fact profoundly miserable. You matured, and through social forces, parental forces, maybe religious forces, you were told that if you were to go to school, if you were to get a job, make money, save money, at last happiness will be given to you. Contentment, satisfaction, that you can look yourself in the mirror and say, yes, I am happy and satisfied and fulfilled. 
all of a sudden you realize, yes, you have the education, you have the job, you have the money, but you are unhappy, miserable. Why? You walk around the lake, everybody is holding hands with somebody else. You want a relationship. It's no longer weed making you happy. It's no longer going to school reading a book that's going to make you happy. It's another human being. Okay? And so you sign up for eHarmony.com or I am lonely and miserable.com. Help, please. Okay? And you write down everything about you. I am 2-2. Two, two. Don't have a job. Drink excessively. I am waiting for my life partner. Okay? And so someone calls you. And you guys go, and remember, with every new component that enters into your life, you have brand new hopes, dreams, and fantasies. Okay? Remember, we are no different than donkeys. A carrot is being held before us. Or a dog chasing after his, ta his tail. We are very much like that. Always pursuing, journeying, in hopes of stability. What we call Sabbath. A place where you can rest. So you get married. Okay? I mean, after lots of conflict, lots of struggle with your girlfriend or boyfriend, ultimately, they say, will you marry me? Oh, and just think about marriage, man. You're going to go on trips together. You're going to buy a house together, garden together, build a shed together cook together, clean together. And then, of course, the biggest prize, you have a family, you have children, and you can call them your own. No longer dogs or cats or reptiles, tiny little creatures. And your intentions are good. You don't want to cheat on your spouse. You don't want to spank your kids. Deep down you're going to say, the world has never seen a father like me. I'm going to show them. And so you, your wife or husband, and a couple of kids will live out your life for a number of years. And slowly you realize that, well, children leave you no time and no energy. Your relationship with your spouse has changed dramatically. You wake up exhausted. You function throughout the day exhausted. And you go to sleep exhausted. And the cycle repeats itself. And then you realize that long time ago you read a story in one of the Gospels about the prodigal son. You're telling your son or your daughter not to do certain things, but they're far too stupid to understand. You didn't have children to be frustrated, and there you are, frustrated. You didn't get married to be angry all the time, but there you are, angry all the time. At what point did happiness turn into misery? This is the allegory of the cave, people. Don't get me wrong, it's a great life. Going to school, getting a job, it is quite great. Getting married, having children, taking care of your parents, beautiful. But keep in mind, we are cursed animals. There is something about us that will forever remain dissatisfied. Before going on, let me just tell you a story about uh, any of you like fish, not to look at, but to eat. Oh, yeah. yeah. Any of you like salmon fish? Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, they're quite ugly and hideous looking, but they don't really even taste good. But anyways, there is something about salmon that is quite tragic. And... Uh, So it begins its life as an egg, 
okay? And then the force of the water or the river or the pond pushes this egg downward. And ultimately it finds itself into this great pool of water. And now it's no longer an egg. It's actually like a quacking fish swimming all around. Beautiful looking fish, really. Has lots of fun. Okay, likes to go on vacation, drink coffee. Uh, the fish wants to learn from its own experiences, you know, reads books, goes to school, gets a job. The fish eventually mates, I don't know if they do or not, somehow, okay. I mean, everything about the life of the salmon fish on the outside, it looks absolutely perfect. But something really tragic happens. At a certain point in the life of the salmon fish, it's psychology. It says, this is not my home. This is not my home. This is not my home. I don't really know how salmons are wired. I think they're as nutty as human beings. That Despite having a home, either in iron or bronze or silver, there are these moments of profound unhappiness and discontentment. And at a certain point, the salmon summons up all of its will and courage and says, I'm going to go back home. Now, here's the thing you need to understand. The salmon has been guided by his or her or its five senses for all these years. When the salmon lived in the iron, the five senses were in control. When he lived in the bronze, the five senses were the GPS to his, uh, its life. When it went into the silver mode, the five senses continued to be the guiding mode. All of a sudden, the salmon says, this is not my home. It seems that it's being guided by something different, by intuition by instinct, something that the senses can't reach, can't touch, can't see, taste, smell, or hear. Okay? And all of us have that, those moments where you have this gut feeling. The only problem with us and the salmon fish is despite you and I having a gut feeling that the world you occupy is no longer any good for you, you don't have the resources, the will, the proper emotions to drag yourself out of that world and begin to shed your skin and live a new life. The salmon is very, very different. The salmon, because it lacks the sort of fears that you and I have, and remember fear for the most part, is socially constructed, okay? Society injects inside you and I emotions that are not natural to us. So next time you get angry, before you express your anger in a mean-spirited way, ask yourself, how is your culture responsible for this particular emotion and the way it's expressed? Remember, in many ancient cultures, China, Japan, India, Africa, Middle East, Mexico, you are never aggressive, but you're always passive aggressive. Because the cultural etiquette will never allow you to express your anger outwardly. Okay? You, have a, you may have a lot of resentment about your friends, about your father, about your mother, but you keep them within yourself. The culture gives you too much shame. You have too much respect for your elders. It's not like here, where you're 18, your instructor happens to be like 90, and for some odd reason you don't like what he or she has said, and you kind of stand up and you flip them off and you leave the classroom. That's not the way it's done. Okay. So the salmon fish says, iron is not my home, bronze is not my home, silver is not my home. 
this is the allegory of the cave. Everything is now seen as an illusion. I was duped, deceived, not only by my parents, not only by my society, not only by media, but also by my own assumptions. Mostly, the narrative is written by society, of course. Okay? The salmon during the springtime, you know what it does? It does something that the fish basically are not supposed to do. The salmon begins to fly. It goes against the current of the river. It goes upwards. The problem with that is the bears are no longer in hibernation. They are awake. They are hungry. As the salmons go upwards, many of them are caught by the bears. Few reach their destination. And you know where the destination is? Where the egg was. A place they had never seen. A place no one talked to them about. A place they had never read, and yet inside them. I suppose you could say that the fish at a certain point comes to realize inside them is a kingdom of God. This kingdom is where they were supposed to go. But it took them all this thing. They had to live the iron. They had to live the bronze. They had to live the silver to realize that none of them are any good. Completion is in annihilation, is in death, is in reflection, understanding. If you really want stability, it's where your home is. And that home for us human beings, if you happen to be religious, it's the kingdom of God. It's enlightenment. It's the Tao. It's the light of Muhammad. It's the Sabbath. If you happen to be an intellectual, it's justice, it's fairness, it's equality.